The following presentation was recorded at the 2014 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2014 for helping make these videos possible. Okay, thank you. Um, actually expected uh, about half turnout today, so I think I'm pretty much on target. <laughs> um, this is what happens when you do it on the last day and when you don't crest earlier in the week, but I was pretty flexible um, this weekend, so I prefer to sort of do it whenever we can get around to it. So I'm probably going to turn things around a little bit on, on, on a lot of A lot of the talks that I've been to has been very much focused on the system administration side, on infrastructure. So before I really get started, how many in here are developers? Very good. So that was the whole point. I want to, instead of talking about how does this all work with, from an operations perspective, how does this help you as a developer? Before I really get started, I guess I need to go through this. Uh, just, I, it does say Red Hat. I tried to tone it down a little bit uh, for today's talk, but I do work for Red Hat. Um, my job has been in the uh, IT industry has been quite extensive, all kinds of different to uh, types of topics. I started out as a consultant, grew into all kinds of different roles, uh, primarily initially with commercial software. As the prof professional side, used open source, freeware, BBSs, and that whole shebang when I was off uh, client side. So I've always been into open source and being able to distribute code, but what paid the check, pay, the, you know, my paycheck for a long time was commercial, uh, commercialized software. And as it says down here, I'm paid to go around talking about technology. Uh, that's really my, in my job description. Um, my, my job is to try to explain to people that don't necessarily become, comes from a technology background, why this technology can help them or how it can help them. So, before I get into sort of uh, what I want to say, so from, from this crowd here, what are some of the challenges you have when it comes to, hey, I need to do development. What is it that takes the most time? What frustrates you the most? Yep. Meetings. Meetings, <laughs> yep. Um, in the actual process of development, is there, uh, what, what kind of tasks are you doing that are most time consuming? So let's say that I want to do a web application. Can I just start coding that, or what, is the, what do I need to have before I can start coding my, my web application? You, know, you need to have some place to put the code and test it, and then sometimes I need to convince someone else that I need those libraries versus those libraries, and we have the, the usual fight about what's the best solution for everyone, right? I tend to find the meetings are all about that, <laughs> yeah, right? Really, my time spent when I was a developer was to figure out what do my, either my customer or my colleagues need the app to do, not necessarily me coding it, or even worse, telling me, or me telling them how the app had to be coded, not in their way, but in the agreed upon way. And that's not really different from an open source project. When we collaborate, we've got to have some common rules, otherwise no one can figure out what's going on. Well, we all have to come to agreement, hence we have our spam list, I mean, we have our flame walls on our mailing list and so on, right? So I try to come up with a, so here's an idea of what usually happens when a developer wants to go. First, we start with a great idea. You know, that could come from the boss that says, we need to do this to make a lot of money. So this is the new app, go, go make it happen. Or it could have been you saying, if we did this differently or we just did that, we could change the world. Right? A lot of open source projects starts out, you know, the whole idea is everyone else is doing the wrong way, I have a better way of doing that. So we start with a good idea. That's usually the fun part. The next part is getting people involved, because a lot of times when you are at work, you need an approval. Basically, there needs to be some funding behind you so you can get access to the equipment and so on. Or, if you're in the open source side, where can I run this stuff? Do I need to you know, set something up on a web server somewhere in the cloud? Do I need to spend money on that? Or can I convince my Fedora project manager, you know, the ambassador, to let me borrow their server for a while. I mean, how do I get access to that? Or do I use just GitHub and all the other? But GitHub just is my source code. I need to run it, right? 
So this may be optional. You may already have at home a system with an OS that you're using, but every development project comes with a ton of dependencies. So one of the things I always find uh, troubling when I do any kind of development is if I start to use the same OS for everything, everything gets messed up very quickly. I don't know what's there, I don't know what versions they have, and that can be conflicts between two or three different projects I'm running at the same time. So I end up with different VMs. Maybe I can run them on my own, maybe I have enough hardware to run a lot of uh, that at home, but I still need to set up the OS. I still need to know how to do that, I need to set up networks. I have all these different things that, in my, with my developer hat, those are really not things that I was hired to do. Then it comes to, well, okay, now I need to put my server on there. I mean, my Apache, my PHP, my, my passenger for Ruby. I need to do all this other stuff just to run my code. Okay, I can Google it and someone set it up to get some initial up, but then I find out later that I did a, you know, my code won't work because it wasn't set up right. Oh, maybe I'm making a lot more code than I was supposed to because, hey, it was already out there. I was just not aware of it. So knowing the frameworks, knowing how they're configured, is important. Doing that in, a, in an enterprise situation, a job, when all of a sudden you have a whole team of people around you that says, well, you can't do it that way. We have standards, we have security groups, we have operating, uh, operators that says, well, we can only maintain it within these limits. So lots of meetings and hashing that out and being frustrated that you can't do it the easy way because you, they, they insist on doing the hardware or using old tools. And then we're going to add some more stuff. Got some databases. If I want to do something that is a little more out of the, hey, I just have a single app for, for testing, or I need to load balance or figure out how do I code for failover. You know, if I need to have a session with a shopping cart, you know, how do I make sure that it doesn't go away? I need to code for that. I need to have the infrastructure there to do that. I need to set it all up. Again, not development, right? I want to code. I want to make my cool app. Once I have all that in place, I can start doing that. Now, as I said, I'm paid to talk to customer, uh, to I mean, uh, IT customers in general, people that are interested in figuring out how to solve their problem better. I have customers where that process takes them almost two years. Literally, from the time someone says this needs to be done till the equipment and everything is set up and, and we can actually start the project. When I talk to them about what OpenShift does in a couple of seconds, they look at me like I'm crazy. If they could get it down to a week, they will think that was a miracle. That's the problem we're trying to solve. This is what this weird word called PaaS is all about, platform as a service. The whole idea that you, don't, you get a service that gives you all of these things I just talked about out of the box, and you can now concentrate on doing what you're much better at and maybe much more interested in is to get the code running and not have to fight with all these guys about, you know, how do we need to set up, what frameworks do we need to, comes out of the box, it's already set up for it. So after you've got things gone, I mean, you've got your machine, I had, a, there was a good talk on Friday that discussed some of the bad things we do for when we build and, and control stuff and I, I really, it got me thinking that, yep, I recognize that scenario a lot. How do I actually create and build my project consistently? Because one thing is in my development system that it works great. Once I get it deployed somewhere or someone else tries to deploy it, that's when I get all the, hey, this doesn't work kind of uh, ideas, right? I could, of course, design it wrong up front. I could have done, put a hot coded URLs and all kinds of other stuff in my code, bad practice no matter what I do. But in general, I need to find a way to consistently build my software for deployment so it can be done. So I need to document it right, I need to use the right methodologies, and I need to understand that this may be deployed on a different server that I didn't control. You also need a place to put your software. A lot of us, at least, I'm you know, looking at Git as, an, as a good option. If you are working for a company that might be an internal repository somewhere you have to deal with, Getting access to that to create a new project can also be a lengthy process. <laughs> uh, or even getting commit access or um, similar write access to existing trees you know, usually takes some time. And another example would be, okay, in order for me to really prove my code works, 
I got to build something into it to validate my code. So if you look at, it, for instance, a lot of open source builds that are done, like for Fedora and package building, there's these processes running every night for building. It gives you this long report about the state of the code. How can they do that? Well, they're firing all, all these test scenarios that says, test this operation, test this operation, and that status report comes back. So if someone checks in some piece of bad code, it may have fixed the problem in that routine, but it had a side effect on something else, and by firing all the test scenarios, you get a nice report about whether that project actually is a stable build or not. But you've got to develop those. They need to be part of it. A lot of times, those are your delivery tests if you're in an enterprise. They say, well, your code has to do this, and this is how you prove that it works. And of course, they make sure your deployments are predictable. So when you develop something or you deliver that, you say, well, I, did, I developed it to work in that environment you described, and I can actually guarantee that it does that. And there's a lot more than that. So how many here have heard of the word DevOps? How many here are tired of hearing about it? <laughs> the, what DevOps is, in this sense, is the, the idea that as a developer, I'm not in a, I'm not in a bubble. We, we all got to realize that. You know, I, while I would think I have the most important job because the software that everyone depends on comes out of my, my fingers, it still needs to run, and I'm not the one who's the operational ex, uh, person that keeps it running. You know, once I'm done with my delivery, hopefully I have another project to work on. Right? I'm not the, the system admin or anything like that. So we normally look at a process that says, well, we have a need. It's a business need. I'm sorry, this might be a little bit too marketing. But you know, you're fulfilling some kind of idea that says, well, a problem. You're solving some kind of issue. And once you've, you, that leads you to development, and that leads you to, to operation. And those are different people, different uh, interests that are at play. And you need to sort of collaborate. And to me, DevOps is all a matter of getting that collaboration working. So from an operation perspective, when I talk to, to um, the admins out there, I mean, they are very much, you know, particularly in the government, security, you know, are you fulfilling all the government standards? Can you fulfill these protocols? Can you do IPv6? All that stuff. Can we, can we make sure it's compliant with our internal standards? They, they have a long laundry list of things that has to be there. We also, of course, have, again, it says business, but consider that as your requirement. Well, who needs it? When do they need it? I mean, if I take 18 months to just get started developing, by the time I've done my development and I'm, I'm done production, the world has moved on, right? When we look at, a, at companies like Twitter or even Facebook, they do daily deploy, multiple deployments to production a day. They don't have this long cycle to do that. And the reason they can do it is because they control the process, just like an open source project does. So they can do tests automated. They can have all these automated processes going on. But you have a demand. You have a set of requirements. So this solution has to be there by a certain timeline. Sometimes that's your boss telling you. Sometimes that's what you're saying. In order for me to help someone else with a problem, I need to have this out to them sooner than later. And that's why we sort of hack during the night or the weekend and say, here on Monday, <laughs> go, go for it. Right? I made something cool. Sometimes that works. And of course, on the development, we want to not have to spend our time on stuff we don't need to. We want to use some new features, some new flashy stuff. A lot of times we go, well, if I coded it with these libraries, like in Node.js, I didn't have to do all this other stuff, and my app actually looks pretty cool in all the devices. So I want to use that library, not my old stuff that I've been using with my static websites, right? Um, I want to be able to you know, make my life easier. I want to be able to test stuff easier. I mean, this is why some people love IDEs and other people hate them because there's so many not such stuff in there. But this is part of what a good development environment provides. All these things go together, that is DevOps. Once all of these guys work around the same goal, that's that up. And that's what we're trying to do with OpenShift. When I say we, that I will get into a little bit of history, but that means Red Hat in this sense. So all of this is based on a concept called containers. This is a little bit on the system admin side. But what containers allows us to do is to create a known template of system resources. It could be a server setup. It could be a security setup. And we can maintain them individually from the application. And to us, as, when we do development, that's just your template. This is our system that we get. 
And it means that we can instantiate that template literally in seconds. And you have a full functioning, completely set up and ready to use server. I don't know if you heard of the word, the, the project called Docker or Project Atomic. That's literally what happens when you instantiate a Docker instance today. Now, OpenShift doesn't do it with Docker yet. That's coming. That is absolutely on the agenda. But it does with some other technologies and achieves the same idea, just in a different way. And some people call it a harder way, but that's for the operators to worry about, not you. So we maintain a template. And that's the only, so if we want to do an update to say, hey, these libraries need to be updated, or I need to set up a new database connector that is standard for all my projects, that's a simple update. And anything that uses that template can be updated in seconds. That's the cool thing. You're no longer involved. You know, oh, someone changed the password in the database, change the template, done. You don't have the password in your code anywhere. You're not supposed to. They are a lot easier to deal with in a VM. Why? Because the VM requires you to take ownership of the whole OS. This is the difference between infrastructure and platform as a service. So by using platform, you get all of these other components on top of the OS given to you. If you go directly to the VM, sure, install your own VM, you know, your own OS, own all the components. It's cool, it's flexible, but it takes a lot of time. And the security of the containers is, and this is my statement here, uh, my, my feeling on it, they are at least as secure, if not better, than a VM. A lot of, when I, when I look at VM security, they all depend on, well, the hypervisor no one has access to. Well, once you compromise the hypervisor on, a v, on an EXX I box, I got pretty wide access to anything, and it doesn't stop me. One of the things that KVM built into it is that it even has these segments on the OS that so the OS can't even wipe between them. So if you compromise one VM, you don't get access to another. But still, the containers maintain this atomic or the split between the different deployments for you. And there is no access from one container to another. If you compromise one, that's it. Even though it runs as a process on the box, it doesn't have access to any underlying services. Lightweight. So I don't know how what the size of your laptops or workstations are in general. My guess is it's at least eight gigs or more in RAM. How many VMs can you run with eight gigs of RAM? I mean, are you guys running VMs today to do development? One or two. One or two? If I told you that with the same size of box, I can easily run about 20 containers. Would that interest you? Right. So with less resources, I have more flexibility. It's pretty cool. This is why I'm, I'm a big fan of Docker uh, as, a, as a whole, to see where that takes us. Because it, the promise of not only easy management, but I can take my old hardware and want a lot more stuff on it, I love it. So this is my only architectural slide. I promise I won't really go into the depths of this. I didn't say from the get-go, please do interrupt me if you have questions. But I want to show you a little bit of what OpenShift is all about. So behind the scene, this is a condensed version of everything we have. So underneath everything is REL. And it doesn't care where it runs. Yeah, I can run it in a VM. Again, they are containers. They're not VMs. So I'm running containers inside a VM, having fun. Uh, I can run on bare metal, so I set up my machine, or I can run in the cloud. Uh, it, as long as it runs RHEL or Senders or something else like that. Now, I'm pretty sure Debian might have some packages today uh, on, your, on the original site, but the default installer will automatically do YUM commands and so on. It, you can tell it, hey, the repository is already there, just start installing, and that will work with Debian too. So if you know exactly what repos to point to, you don't have a problem. So we have two types of machines. They can actually exist at the same node. My demo is all one machine. So we have one, so something called a broker. It's basically the administrator. That's the guy that manages the installation. He's the guy, or it's the guy, person that has the, 
database of all the infrastructure, knows where everything is, tells everyone what to do, doesn't do any of the job. He's a true manager. Right. The node is what contains all our containers. In OpenShift, we call them gears. So when I create an application, it basically deploys conceptually a gear. A gear is implemented using a couple of very some people hate SLinux, some people love it. I find that most people that hate SLinux has not really wanted to learn about it. So every time it tells you that, hey, there's a security problem, the solution is to disable it. Right? Don't disable SLinux. Learn about it. It will save your butt. So the gear is actually primarily secured with SLinux. That means that when I go on and actually lock on to that gear with SSH, I can't see anything but my own stuff. I have no access to other people's files. I have no access to anyone else. But when I do a PS, um, it would show me all processes. I only see my own. Even though I may be one out of 20 others in that box, I can't see any of their processes. I can't see all the kernel processes. I can't see anything but my own stuff. There's also C groups involved to manage resources. So I can split my machine up in small parts so something doesn't take all the resources. And then a few other concepts like namespaces to ensure that files are not shared when they're not, not supposed to be and so on. Once a gear is created, what goes into it is basically your code repository. And here's the, the fun part of it. The recipes, the templates of OpenShift are called cartridges. So a gear can only be instantiated based on a, a, on a cartridge. So basically that tells it, OK, container, this is what you need to look like. And that comes from the cartridge. That is an open spec. So setting up a new cartridge, creating your own, is pretty simple. You know, I mean, there's a spec file. And you set it up and deploy it, and you set up your own way of doing things. Pretty easy. Within that cartridge, you may also add sub-cartridges. And these did not show up right. But So you can say, OK, I want to run a PHP application. I also want to associate a database. That's just another, it's, it's an, call it an add-on cartridge. I'm not sure why that word is better than anything else. But I mean, I can use MySQL for any kind of language. It doesn't, so it's the same kind of recipe, same kind of template, regardless of what language I'm using. But my PHP cartridge has special rules of how do I access it? Because that's different than my Ruby, my Perl, my Java. You can also add. Dependencies like, say, on Jenkins and other features that controls your build. So now you have a full, complete build environment for continuous integration. I don't know how, how many here is familiar with Jenkins? Uh, since you're developers, I'm assuming that's not a foreign word. <laughs> okay. Um, so we add a lot of additional features to it. It still has the log files, and as I said, you can SSH, SSH into it, you can run cron jobs in there. It's a complete box from your perspective, but it runs as an isolated environment. You, as a developer, will use a REST interface to access it. There's a command line version, there's a web browser version, and you can use, there's a plugin for Eclipse, I think it's there for NetBeans too, and a couple of others have made plugins to it. It's a fairly simple REST interface to implement, so it's actually fairly easy to do. So you can pick, if you like command line, you don't have to leave it. You don't need to go to an IDE to do any of this stuff. If you like a web interface, it's a nice web interface. And if you really insist, you can code your own API on, on top of the rest and make your own app that accesses it. Doesn't matter. But all that does allows you to say, you know, I want to create a gear, I want to delete one, I want to promote it, do something else with it. But it just defines saying, this is what I want to work on. When you actually have code to do, all you do is use Git. You're already using probably Git or something very close to it as source control. I can't imagine any of you as a developer not using a source control already. It may not be your most active thing. You may not check in very often. Nor do you if you don't. But it's there because it's a requirement, right? Well, we use that mechanism to deploy code. So the moment you check in to Git, it's deployed and running, done. So all I have to do is follow my standard routine for, for, for deployment. I mean, for coding. Don't have to invent a new world, a world of 
hey, I have to go in there, I have to copy the files, I have to run this command, blah, blah, blah. No, it's done for you. And then, once you've done that, the website responds. And I'll show that in the demo. So, there are three different versions of OpenShift. What I'm going to show to you is the community version, the cool version, because that's where all the new stuff is. <laughs> um, there is an online version, and the fun thing is that actually came before Origin. So, long story short, it started as more or less as an experiment from Red Hat saying, is there really interest in that? Someone had come up with this concept. So, we actually deployed OpenShift in the cloud on AWS two and a half years ago and said, come on, come all, tell us how this works, tell us what we need to improve, add extension to it. You know, it was an open architecture, so you can add your own cartridges and so on. Um, well, let's say it's been a stunning success. Today we have um, in the neighborhood 1.5 or more million apps running out there that we're hosting for free. Anyone can go and sign up for an account to get up to three gears for a free account. If you are working on open source projects, you just email openshift.redhat.com and request more resources. If you are a commercial entity, you can buy additional resources. So there's a free hosting service right here to do your PHP, to do pretty much any kind of coding that you can imagine. Of course, there's a supported version called OpenShift Enterprise. This is the one that is always way behind everything else, but it's also the one that's been tested the most. So we use, the, the standard part of it is, we, you know, all the cool stuff, all the fun stuff, all the experimentation happens as origin. A lot of it trickles down into online first. And then we, because there's so many users on that, I mean, kicking the tires on something new with that many users, we don't have a QA department that is that big at Red Hat. I wish we did. So putting it out there to see how it works is one of the best ways we can test anything. And sometimes an idea goes up there, and, nah, it didn't work. And then it just goes away. But the good ideas stay and eventually ends up in the enterprise version. So, prepare. This is what you need to do to run in OpenShift. Done. That creates my server with, uh, with running PHP and a database backend. This executes in less than 10 seconds. If you have a local box, it can be as, you know, close to five. That's your wait time. What this actually does is several things. It not only creates the gear, it clones the repo to your local machine. It's all ready for you to start coding after this. So your next step is go to the directory where the new application is located, start adding some files, start coding, put it into your git. Is that command 4 and 21? Because this is uh, sometimes the level of my git knowledge. Um, this is the new command you may not use that often, push. Because what you actually have is a clone of the repo that is inside the gear. So all you're doing is saying, okay, take my repo, push it up to where it actually belongs. That deploys it. That does all the work for you. And then you just go to the web browser and you're done. So really, your time is spent where it's fun, there. Right? Yes, when, when I do IHC, it does a complete clone and you get the repo. So if you don't tell, so this command doesn't tell it what is the application, right? And I'm gonna show one with, where I actually give it a source code reference and say, go out to Git and plug it in with this code so I can start from that. So because if we don't wanna give you a blank site that comes up with a full full, we put in a single file, usually a static HTML file, like a hello world. That's what you're gonna find in, in your directory checked in, that's it. And now you can start adding some more cool stuff. Add a little bit about Jenkins because a lot of times it's not enough to just compile and build. You've got to be able to control when you test scenarios, verify that everything is done according to spec. All you need to do is associate your gear with Jenkins. Once you've associated it, uh, well, before you can do that, you need to have a Jenkins gear. 
That's how you create a Genjin key. Again, a couple of seconds, you're done. It does create a weird password the first time. So the first thing I usually do is I sign on as admin with a new password and change it to something I can remember because it's a scrambled one. But other than that, it's ready out of the box. And then what I can do is I can say, OK, now I have Jenkins and I have an existing gear. Uh, just go in and add Jenkins abilities, uh, add the sub gear to it. It links it up, creates the job in Jenkins or the project, links the task in. When I now hit git push, it runs the Jenkins job to build it instead of running a build locally. And I can log on to Jenkins and I can change and I can control how that build works. So if I want to add all these cool additions to verify my code, run all my tests, and give reports back and email my boss if everything is OK, that's there and runs automatically. How do you get started before I do the demo? OpenShift.com, anyone can sign up for free. We do, you do need an email address. Um, the only thing I've seen emails on is basically when the server goes down for maintenance. Oh, lately we've been cleaning up. So people like me that had old apps we hadn't used for a long time got emails saying, um, you haven't used it, so if you're not interested, we're going to delete it for you. <laughs> Those are the kind of emails that I've been getting, that's it. Another way is, to say, well, I don't want to really run it in the cloud. I want to run my own stuff. Well, there are a couple of options. The whole community project is hosted on openshiftgithub.io. Uh, lots of good examples out there, like explanations of how to install on different platforms. And here is the basic source code. Just go ahead, help yourself. OpenShift is based on Ruby, so it helps being a Ruby programmer if you want to extend or want to contribute to the project. That's it. It's not that tough. If you do want to do it simpler with an existing CentOS or CentOS installation, for instance, this guy here has all the installation. Basically, it's a single shell script you run on the box. It will validate that everything is there. If you tell it to, it will go and set up the repos right, all that stuff, and tell you know, say, OK, I want to have a node, I want to have a broker, and it will set all the nodes up. So all you need to have is the systems up and running and will install it all for you. To be a developer, you do have a prerequisite. You need the IHC command. Of course, you need Git, too, but I'm assuming Git is already there. <laughs> OK? So if you haven't done Ruby installs before, that's the install. A Ruby gem, or in real world, you can do yum install RHC. It works too. Um, so that's as simple as it gets, and it's a very small piece of code. It's not a big deal. It, all it does is interface from a command line to that REST interface. I mentioned already the cartridges. If you are interested in developing cartridges, this is a great link to go to actually get the cartridge specification and lots of examples of approaches and so on. Uh, it does base itself on YAML, so be prepared if you're not a fan of that language but, or that's, that format. But it is actually fairly straightforward to get to. So I will go behind the podium. I hate being behind the podium, but I can't type on the keyboard unless I do that. So I'm sorry about that. Yeah, I know. At some point, I'm going to learn how to do that. I'm going to have to switch the terminal over here so I can, you guys can see what I'm typing, because I can't see over there and do this at the same time. So hopefully, the mirror will work. on. There we go. See, you're seeing exactly what I'm seeing. Look at that. So everyone can see that. So as you probably notice, this is running inside a VM. Why did I do that? All I'm doing is a browser here. Well, for a couple of reasons, I don't want to mess with my network on my workstation. So everything I do is always localized in the VM. If I screw it up, I'm just screwing up the VM, not the workstation that I depend on everything else for. Fine. Um, but other than that, this is just a Fedora VM. That there's nothing magically about it. So in here is a browser. And as you can see, I already have Jenkins in there. And that was just because I may want to show that, depending on what you ask me questions about. But let me, ask, let me go in and say I want to add an application. So I'm doing this the browser way, the non-developer way, I think, because in the end, 
clicking around is not what I like to do. You know, if I can run a script to do it all, that's what I like. But this is sort of very guided and helps you understand a little bit about what's going on. So when I say create, I get the list of all the installed cartridges. And this is where the upside comes in. Guess who defines these cartridges? Right. Those cartridges is a collaboration of the result of the collaboration between the ops and your lead developers. It says, this is what we need to do these projects. These are the type of technologies, and everyone agrees, yep, for security is implemented, all these standards are fulfilled, we get approval, and now it becomes part of the menu you can pick from. Pre-approved, already set up to use. So your, op your op upside knows that you're running within the, the, the right stuff, and you're not getting that email later when you have deployed your coolest app that works and saying, well, you can't run it like that because it's not allowed. So let's say I want to create a standard PHP app. I'll just hit the PHP button, and that gets me to a screen that basically asks me a very few questions, and the only one I need to answer is what to give it a name. What name to give it, sorry. Switch that, those words around. So I can call it whatever. Notice that it actually tells me the URL that I'm working on. So this URL is partly prefixed. So the first part is example.com. You know, my local installation, that's what I picked. <laughs> Um, so that comes um, from your infrastructure. Then most likely it will be uh, your employer, your project name, like fedoraproject.org or something like that. The next part, the one called here, is actually my domain that I define on my account. And I can have many domains. They can define different access so you can share with team members. So some team members have access to one domain so you can work together on the same projects, all kinds of other cool stuff. But in most cases you will just need one. And then the app name. That's it. So by doing that, I have a unique name by host name, right? So what, when I create my app, I've always decided what host name to give it. Now, I know we all want it to be called you know, www.mybestapp.com. That can still be done. Once we have it created, you can go in and add an alias. But this is how OpenShift knows your, your, um, your application during development. If I have existing source code, and it could be in GitHub, it could certainly also be local, I give it there. If I don't give it anything, it just gives me that static hello world. And then these two down here are not allowing me to do any choices because I have a very small installation. But in essence, what, what can happen behind the scene is we can have multiple sizes of installations or gears available. So some apps work fine, very little memory, like small, most PHPs don't require a lot of resources. But try a Java app. Uh, and you may need a little bit more. Now, got to be honest, Java runs in the same size here. It is, fi it is 512 megabytes that is defined a, a me of memory that is defined as our small gear. And I have deployed many apps on, uh, with, with Java that runs happily within that. Now, have I have hundreds or thousands of users accessing them? Access no, but they will run fine for at least a standard type application with a backend database that does kind of stuff. So because I only have one gear size available in my, my current, I, can only, I, I can't do a drop down here. But it would normally tell you what you have access to of sizes. This is also what tells you what environment you're going to. So there will be, for instance, oh, you have small in dev, you have small in QA, and, and so on. And they might be slightly different in resources. They may allow you different things that you can do. You may allow more disk space in QA than in development, for instance. Or particularly in production versus your test. And that's all something that can be set up behind the scene that controls what those names mean. You're, definitely, you're basically just defining the environment you're in by picking the right name. This guy here, I'm not going to set, but what this does is to allow you, your application to automatically scale depending on demand. All I have to do is set it down to scale with web traffic. So once your app becomes the best app since slide cheese, everyone knows that they've got to download the app on the mobile phone and you have th hundreds of thousands of users hitting it. When the request rate gets up and the gear gets so busy that it reads that rate, it will automatically make another copy and another copy until it can meet the demand and scale up. You didn't do anything. And then when it hits the other way around, it will scale back. So now, as an operator, I can have an infrastructure where I can have 10 apps that may be different, busy at different, interval, uh, different times, and they can all share the same infrastructure, the same resources. So I hit Create Application, and if I'm 
not mistaken, I just restarted the VM. I don't know what it is, but my KVM screws up every time I sweep my machine, so I have to reboot my boxes. That's it. It's created an app for me. It's out there, it's deployed. It gives me a little bit of, um, okay, if you've never done this before, here's your next steps, okay? Um, so it tells me, because I have done this on the web, I got to, you know, in order for me to get a hold of the source code, I need to clone the application. And here's the command to do that. The funny thing is that this is correct, but we have a shortcut for that command that I'm going to show you. I don't need to copy that whole thing anymore. In the earlier versions, we had to. And then it also tells you, if you never not used Git before, this is how you commit. All right, so a little bit of help. But I want to go and get it really get started here. So here's the actual management, my edit page of my app. So this allows me to actually add additional, so I can add a database feature by just clicking here. I can add Jenkins support and so on. Or I can just go to the application by clicking there. This is my application one. If you see very carefully, I don't know how readable it is, but that's the URL that we created before. Full app. Granted, it's just an index.php. Uh, it's not really a lot of sexy stuff going on. Let me show you what the code looks like. That one is probably way too small for you. So I will go in here and, oops, that's probably too big. Is that better to read or easier to read? Yes. Okay. So, I see command, git clone, and I call this first, right? I can write the git clone command too, and then give it the whole URL. This is the shortcut. So it said, I cloned it, I added a directory call first. There it is. And, okay, there's a couple of more files, but this because we can actually create, I mean, it's a whole PHP engine, so there's a couple of more dependencies there, but the only app in the PHP is the index, and then it adds a health index that allows the system to actually ping itself there, seeing whether the gears are responding or not. So let me go and just do the biggest development change ever. Just go down. So because it's a single file, everything is in here. I would have shot my developers back then if they did that. You may notice that it's not straight out HTML that we are using anymore. It's this is very much in the HTML5 world of allowing this page to actually look nice on a browser too, meaning on a phone too, not just in a big browser. Oops. So I can go in here and just do an H2. And that's it. Not going to do a lot. I'm going to do my git add which I really don't need because I only edited the file, so commit. So notice when I build that I get all this weird stuff happening. This is the build actually happening to get when I push. Now it's actually building my stuff. And that is defined by the cartridge. So by customizing the cartridge, you can define what that process is. Or there are some hooks to find in, in a secret directory called dot open shift in your project where you can set, put in hooks, run this when I'm building, after, before build, after build, or before deploy, after deploy, so you can customize this project to your own need. So you still have that control. You're not giving up anything. I did my deployment, and to prove that it actually happened, I refreshed this page, and it's updated. That's the process. Now, I granted we don't do development with such a simple file. I get that. So I, let me do something a little more complex. Let's say I want to do an open uh, a WordPress installation. I got to need PHP. I got to need a database. And I need the uh, WordPress installed. So I did something like people do on TV when they cook. So they, they prepare because I can't remember anything anymore. So I couldn't remember that URL here, but this is the command that I need to fire. Oops. 
hit the right key, and it usually helps. So this is the IHC command to create an application. It creates a application called WordPress based on PHP with a MySQL backend, and then it says, instead of using that hello world, in the, use this code instead. Now I'm hoping I have a connection. I did not verify that, <laughs> um, so it may fail, but it should work. Um, it will take a little longer because it does need to download everything first. But that's it. So what it did tell me was a lot of cool stuff. Now I can say, well, you know, before I really do anything, oh, WordPress. Tell me a little bit about, oops. I thought we could do that. Oh, it's called show now. Uh, Dawn. Don't like changes. Um, here's a little bit of information what's out there, including what's my database stuff. And you can say, oh, cool, now I know what to put in there. Don't do that, because this changes when I move my gear around in, in structure. So this is actually represented. If you notice the connection URL, there's some nasty uh, environment names going on. The username and passwords are part of that. Your connection needs to use that to be OpenShift compliant. That's what this WordPress installation did. So all I need to do now is I, need, I deployed my code. And let me go back here. And lo and behold, see, I now have my gear here listed. Notice that I'm limited to 25 gears. So I can actually set limits for individual users for how much they can do. The website is called that, because this is my domain. It's a WordPress there. So when I hit this one, it will, this is WordPress running. See, I've been here before. I had to. Uh, I tried all kinds of passwords, even long ones. They kept calling them all week. Uh, what's going on? Yeah, yeah. So install WordPress. Dum -de 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 Running. So now I have a WordPress installation. I have all the source code. So if I need to go in and adjust something and see how it works, I have it all. I just need to change the gear. I mean, go log into the uh, directory that we have, which I can go into. That's what I'm in here. So here's the PHP. Uh, sometimes I'm not too good at figuring out where it puts things. Hmm, interesting. I did expect it to show up in there. And now it shows something up. Yeah, that's not it. Sorry about that. It should have been in there. I'm not sure why it doesn't show up. Let me clone it again just to make sure I got the right thing. I see git clone WordPress. I'm not sure it should be in there. It's not. That is odd. So. This is what happens when the cook doesn't check it first. I need to figure out whether that's a bug or not. But it may simply be me not knowing where it keeps files. So let me do the nasty little search here. And it may have done something nasty like putting it in because this is actually a git repo that was made specifically for, open, uh, for, for, for WordPress. And it may have figured out, well, we don't want to install that O1O again. We just put it in a central location and refer to it. And that may be what I'm looking at here. And see the database setup is in here. It uses all the environment variables. And I'm trying to figure out where the root is set for the actual application. So I should be able to find W content, but maybe not. Nope. So that will be the whoops that I kind of knew was going to happen, even though I tried. It's there. 
but somehow not showing up because the code is definitely running. Um, and it should be in the PHP. So I've got to remember to test certain things before I say them. But the whole idea of doing these exercises, I mean, I can use someone else's Git repo and have my project initialized, and now I can easily change the code, see the effects. I can use the command line as I'm here, or I can use my IDE. And you might go, well, if all this is running on a separate server, all my debugging, how is that going to work? I'm going to say, you know, there's these little processes we start that can allow me to step by step through different processes and see what, where I screwed up, because that's usually me that makes the error, not the code. Well, then we have a port forward on the gears. We have all kinds of access to this gear running, so I'm not on the actual box here. So this is my, ah, uh, so I actually put that in the wrong directory, but or did I? Nope. So I can do this, all kinds of RSC commands. So one of the commands that we have is, what's really going on on this box? All right, so now I'm on SSH actually on the, the running server. This is, all, this is all I can see. This is my running application. And I can kill those processes and all that stuff, just like I can do all. Uh, It's not call app CTL anymore. Go back here, and I can say, it should be called locks. It's not called that anymore either. No, it's called tail. Is my lock going on? What's going on? So I have, still have access to that. I can do port forwarding, so my debugging will work, so I can do my step-by-step. -step. I can add, I mean, I basically have a full running server I never had to set up. All the stuff that you're used to, all your log files, the, the, the files when you deploy them are there. You can even, to a degree, if you allow by the cartridge, you can still change your Apache conf if you want to, or the HTTP conf. It may be locked down. It may say that you can't do that. Again, that is what the compromise goes into. Where do you do certain changes? Would you have access with PHP to PHP uh, INI, or is that something that is given out to you to something to start from? It may already come with a lot of files to say, here's the connector for, here's what you need to do for security. So it may already have those classes defined, that code defined. So it just comes pre-configured, and you don't have to provide it. That's the, the whole idea of this becomes the collaboration and the meeting point between you and your um, operating guys or security guys, because they now know that you have this sandbox to do whatever you want to within that predefined limit. And you can create a, you know, you can have all kinds of different, you can, it doesn't have to be a single PHP gear, and that's for all PHP applications. You can make a cartridge for one type of PHP application or another one, maybe you want to do Java or Perl, whatever, and just create a huge arsenal depending on what type of you know, idea is it that you're trying to implement? What kind of resources do you need? Or what kind of frameworks do you need, rather, behind the scene? And then when you come up and say, well, this framework is not available, then add it to coverage. So, I've been talking for a long time. I know I didn't show the source code, so I'm very sorry about that. But any other question, any questions that doesn't lead with me being embarrassed by not having it work? Yes? So the question was, do I have to use Git? For the actual communication, yes. But what we have done with, with, with Subversion, for instance, is the predominant is to simply set up a hook on the Subversion side that automatically sets up the Git, because that doesn't care where it comes from. So once you chuck it into Subversion, you can run the hook that automatically sends it to the gear. So that's one way of doing it. The problem we have with Subversion really is not agile enough to do what we need, because one of the things Git can do is it creates literally a, a local repo. And it allows you to have repos all over the place. And it's a lot easier to manage than having this centralized idea of everything goes into a central place, having to manage tags and all kinds of other stuff to figure out what you're doing, particularly when you're a team. 
Any other question? Yes? So as you saw, DNS integration was the question. So as you saw, the whole thing was me telling it a name. So really, it's up to who, whatever you want to use for DNS. Out of the box, we give you bind. So if you just do this default install, you get a find bind server that is dynamically updated with a zone or two or how many you want. Uh, so every time you create an app, it gets a new C name. So one of the things is that confuses a lot of people is that the apps don't get separate IPs. Now, if you have many nodes, each node has an IP, and that would be reflected. But each app gets a C name if we talk DNS speak. That points to the node where it's located. That's it. Yeah. So we have, there are plugins for Route Through Tree that you can use, or three, uh, 53. Um, how can I put this? Last time I read the Route 53's uh, conditions, they basically said we don't guarantee an update uh, to come out any sooner than 30 minutes, which kind of kills this whole idea. Um, they may not be the case for normal use, but that's what their condition says. So we've had, you know, we can make the plugin, but we've not had success I mean, at the same level we've had with others in response times from it. But it can be done. What I did with some Route 50 trees was I simply set up a forward to another a DNS server, and you couldn't see the difference. Yes? When you talk about the scaling options, I'm assuming that's within the individual or the shift order or the application you build. But is it possible to cluster multiple so. ones together to get more resources, like for scaling? So there is a, a, I think we are out of time, so let me answer this question and I'll be happy to stay, stay here and answer more questions, okay? So there is a high availability option that you can enable that allow, basically says the gear has to be in so many replicas for it to, to be high available. So by doing that, you, will be on, you need to have more than one node running, which I don't. <laughs> and so you can, def, you can take a failure of any of them and you will be up and running. And you can set up as a condition or as a property on your gear as an administrator that this gear has to have X number of instances running all the time and can go up to Y number of instances. So you can set the limits of them. Now, that will not be something that the developer does that is on the OpenShift administration side, but those are parameters that you can set. So as I said, I will be happy to go outside and, and answer more questions so we can get the next speaker in. Oh, you guys can go to lunch, I guess, because that's in a couple of minutes. Thank you. Customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling.
Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.